Hey everyone, welcome back to Crisis the Cure. Today we are beginning our two episode discussion on their perpetual virginity of Mary. I don't know how long this episode is going to be, but I knew that if I put both episodes together, it'd be too long. So if this episode ends up shorter and the other one ends up longer, um, I'm sorry. Um, I have broken this up in a more logical way rather than a temporal way. And so because this part one will be the historical discussion, it'll go separate. And then the next episode will be on the biblical discussion where we'll be evaluating each claim and, and coming to conclusions for it. So, Yes, the Perpetual Virginia Mary Part 1. I put up a post a few weeks ago teasing that this was what everyone voted on uh, to replace the Kenosis uh, episode, which, I mean, honestly, we have articles on the website on Kenosis, so we may just skip that and move on to other things. If you want to go read up on that, look up Kenosis or Kenotic Theology on uh, the website where I briefly just talk about some of the things I was going to talk about in my episode. Anyway, so y'all voted on this, and I put up a post to, to promote it, and um, it was so hard not to reply to some of the comments, because I was like, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Everything you're saying, I know. We're going to talk about it. So here we are. Um, this episode may get rough, and so I encourage everyone to hear me out before coming to judgment on the issue, um, and especially so. Do not assume that you know my position on this until we get to the end of the second episode. I'm trying to just lay things out as unbiasedly as I can. Uh, of course, my opinion is laid out here and there, um, but you're not going to get the full view that I hold until the very end for the purpose of trying to let people come to their own conclusions and without it being through its own lens, um, at least as best as I can. You, you know, it, it's hard. I try. We try. Anyway, so... There are a lot of debates to be had with Catholicism on Marian doctrine. We all agree. Um, I would say that the major issue with the doctrines on Mary in Catholicism is actually that it's so dogmatic. It, it's officially dogmatic on the point. That is, you, you cannot have a differing opinion. You must hold to Marian doctrines to be Catholic and to have communion with the church. That is a problem. Um, for orthodoxy, a lot of people don't know this, orthodoxy isn't as dogmatic as Rome is on a lot of issues, um, especially the more questionable doctrines regarding Mary, such as the Immaculate Conception, uh, which the Immaculate Conception is the idea that Mary was born without sin. So being dogmatic on something like the perpetual virginity to Mary is just strange to me. It's just very, very odd and narrow. Uh, at the same time, we can't just say that's strange for Catholicism because evangelicals will do the same in the opposite extreme. They'll call the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary heresy. And I'm not really sure how you can do that. Um, I don't think that anyone should be dogmatic on this particular issue. It is true that Marian doctrine ends up being so tightly knitted together for them that, that we knit it together for ourselves, where we don't want to give up an inch, right? We, we don't want to even entertain the possibility that, well, you know, maybe they're right. For example, on theotokos, um, it's a great term, and we'll explain it down the road. We'll explain it briefly here in this episode. Um, it's a great term. It should be held by Protestants, but we shy away from it because it has a slight taint of Catholicism as Catholicism moved more into, well, to be blunt, idolatrous devotion to Mary. It is really difficult to look at Catholicism, especially where I live, and and see Christ, because Mary is at the front and center as this mediator between man and Jesus, which is completely unnecessary. And I say that as one who who sees that that value in the distinctions between Dulia and Latria in, say, the Second Council of Nicaea, even though I strongly disagree with how strong they were on making, again, dogmatic, something that really should not be dogmatic at Second Nicaea. But nonetheless, that, that's the point, is that we, we can't shy away from everything. Just the, like we're not going to shy away from the term orthodox because Eastern Orthodoxy use it. We're not going to shy away from using uh, the Church of Christ just because, you know, a denomination uses it. We're not going to shy away from the term Baptist or Catholic just because someone has used it a particular way, right? Like, there's not a reason to let people have a monopoly on particular terms that have been used in church history. Um, that's a little bit beside the point, I guess. But the whole point is that we can separate this component of the perpetual virginity of Mary and talk about it independently, and that's what we're going to do. 
So while there are various debates to be had on Marian doctrines, such as the Immaculate Conception and the bodily assumption of Mary, one that may not be worth fighting is the perpetual virginity of Mary. And we're going to cover why I'm saying this as we proceed. Um, and if you don't know, the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary is exactly that. The idea that Mary was a virgin her entire life, after G even after Jesus was born. She was ever virgin. But my, my main thesis here is that this is probably not a fight worth duking it out over. If we're going to debate someone on the doctrine of Mary, the perpetual virginity of Mary is neither heresy nor should it be dogmatic for a Christian. And so if that's my position, then, well, why are we talking about this? Why does the topic matter? Well, really, it becomes a point of interest because so many in the church viewed it as a fact of the matter. And that's really the part that Protestants are going to have to grapple with on this. Um, the, the fact that so many in church history have held to this position, including Protestants, uh, makes modern Protestants and evangelicals just uncomfortable. Um, and we need to recognize that especially when we decry the issue as heresy. That, that, that's just going to end us in a, in a bucket of trouble. Um, and we'll get there, just hold off on assuming you know my position again um, until we, we round that corner after the biblical analysis. So Catholics would argue that this topic matters for a couple of issues. Um, I think that their explanations are overstated. Um, for example, one Catholic says that Mary being ever virgin points out that the life in the age to come is a life without marriage and will be as Mary was, as virgins. Uh, I don't get that. I think that's a stretch because even though Mary was without sexual relations before Jesus was born, she was still married. So I don't understand how that follows logically. If it's supposed to be uh, pointing to the age to come without marriage, it doesn't make sense. Um, another reason given is that because... It's one of her virtues. It makes her beautiful, a symbol of the church as the bride of Christ. Um, I think that this is a bit closer of a solid parallel, but it's not really a reason why this particular doctrine could be important. Um, if anything, it's a symbol of how the church should be, but the church as the bride of Christ is not that way. So um, I don't know. It's just interesting. The idea of the church being an undefiled bride is present and an imperative that the church is supposed to strive after, but it has no notion of the perpetual virginity of Mary attached to it. So I don't, I don't see that either. Another um, Catholic says that it matters because it's about her relationship to us. She is our mother, as John is called the son of Mary whenever Jesus entrusts John to her. I think this is just reading too much into the text when Jesus is just entrusting Mary to John. And we are going to come back to that text whenever it comes to the scriptural discussion, because it is a point that Catholics will bring up in favor of the perpetual virginity of Mary. So that will be in the next part. Um, so this is all to say that I think that the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary is really inconsequential. And that's regardless of what position you take, so long as you affirm the virgin conception and birth. Okay. As long as you affirm that Jesus was conceived while Mary was a virgin and she remained a virgin until his birth, then you're good. That, that's all we need to be dogmatic on. This is to say that Catholics will treat this as a historical checkmate against Protestantism, especially the historical discussion that we're about to have. But it's not. It's not one. Because it doesn't affect much of anything. It doesn't affect any of their other Marian dogmas. The only thing it affects is that the church, later on, made dogma something that shouldn't have been made dogma, which... If you don't know what dogma is, it's, it's a doctrine that you cannot disagree with. It's the standard of orthodoxy. Now, on the flip side of that, I think Protestants shouldn't act like this doctrine is a checkmate either, if it is held. I'm not sure why we act like it does, unless we're just conflating Marian doctrines. Um, there, there's not a reason to, to let them think that that's a checkmate. Yeah, that's it. Um, so again, this episode will be speaking to the historical theology. That is how it was understood by various figures in church history. So we're going to start by quoting a Catholic writer, uh, Luigi Gambiro, Gambiro, and he has a book called Mary and the Fathers of the Church. Um, and it actually has a great introduction because it admits that there's really not much written about Mary for the first several hundred years in the early church. It's a great uh, the, the way that he he frames the discussion as he moves through it 
it's very biased, but it's a great work to, to know if you're going to be talking to Catholics because you can cite it. It's a Catholic work, and he's a scholar of patristics, or he's working through patristics. So um, he first points out that within the early church writings known as the Apostolic Fathers, uh, that is those people that came right after the apostles, Mary is rarely mentioned. Luigi explains this with various theological ideas, but the point remains. Now, what we do find about Mary in these writings are the same things we find in the New Testament. They're just re-expressed with an emphasis on the real birth of Jesus. And this was likely given the idea that Jesus was not actually a true man held by some type of proto-Gnosticism. Um, and so, so emphasizing that real physical birth of Jesus would be a crucial blow against Gnostic ideology. Now, a significant work on the subject within the earliest period of the church is called the Proto-Evangelium of James, or the Nativity of Mary, or the Nativity of James. Now, this is an apocryphal work of the New Testament, meaning that it was never considered part of the canon, uh, it was never considered inspired, but it was cited by figures to perpetuate this idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, this is important to know because Catholics will bring up this document. This document has Gnostic tendencies. It really does. I, and I haven't seen anyone really dispute that at length. Um, but regardless, the text focuses on the narrative surrounding Jesus's birth and around Mary. You can read it online for free if you want to. You can go look it up. It's interesting. Uh, most would date this particular writing to the middle of the second century, which would then be A.D. 150 to 200. So pretty early, right? Um, it's often invoked, like I said, by Catholics on the subject. It's significant because it was used by Christians and distributed pretty widely. Um, now we're not going to cover everything about this work, just those points that are relevant to this topic for the sake of time. The book seeks to demonstrate first that Mary was a virgin at the conception of Jesus and during Jesus's birth. But not only this, but it alludes to the fact that she was a virgin after the book presents Mary as devoting herself to the Lord, and she would be working in the temple for her lifetime. In chapter 7 of this work, she takes up this vow of virginity, and then this is followed by her meeting Joseph, who is described as a man of great age, who takes up the role of a guardian and provider over Mary. Joseph is presented as a widower who already has children, uh, which could explain, if it's true, the absence of Joseph from the text regarding Jesus' adult life, uh, the tradition states that Joseph had died uh, by the time Jesus did adult ministry, but it also could explain, and I'm stressing could, the fact that Mary was entrusted to John the disciple instead of other siblings. So really, if we take this text at face value and assume it to be true, it could lead us to believe that the siblings in the New Testament of Jesus were either cousins or step-siblings, which is possible given the, the Greek term that's used for brothers and sisters. We'll discuss that later in more depth. Um, and then it would also allow us to have an explanation for Joseph's absence, but you can have that without this text. So, okay. And then the entrusting of Mary to John, which you can also have without this text. So it, it gives you a little bit more if it's true. Now, whenever it comes to the topic of the perpetual virginity of Mary, um, it could be supported on the grounds of her vow, and assuming that she never broke it, which, I mean, if it's a vow for lifetime service, dedicating yourself to the Lord, then you could assume that from the text that she would remain a virgin. Um, now, it's an apocryphal work, and it's fantastic in terms of it. It's, it's got some interesting stuff in it. Uh, for example, Jesus essentially poofs into existence via a bright light, which is pretty dubious. Um especially whenever we consider Gnosticism. And so really, we, we simply cannot know the source or whether or not the information is true because of it's kind of a compilation of various myths. It's difficult to base a doctrine on this type of document, which makes it an odd document to appeal to, though many do and did. So let's, let's move on. Within the writings of the second century, which is AD 200 to 300, we find a little bit more regarding Mary in the writings of uh, individuals such as Justin Martyr. Uh, really, you find mostly relays of what we find in the text of Scripture. That is, Mary was a virgin at the conception and birth of Jesus, and it doesn't speak to whether or not she remained that way. Justin Martyr, however, seems to be the first Christian writer to connect Mary to Eve. Um, if you don't know that there is an idea in the early church that Mary was a type of new Eve, and Justin Martyr seems to be the first one to mention it. 
she is the mother of the living in contrast to Eve who brought ruin and death. So this theme would eventually be picked up by more Christians and expanded on even as early as Irenaeus um, and on the basis of Jesus being the second Adam. So because Jesus is the second Adam and you have the Adam and Eve figure, then Mary could be this type of a new Eve. This, again, is not particularly relevant to our focus, though. It's just an interesting factoid. So where does the perpetual Virginia and Mary come back up? Well, it comes back up in the time of Origen around AD 248, so the 3rd century. Origen, in his commentary on Matthew 2.17, states the book of James, that is the text that we um, just spoke about, the, the apocryphal work, records that the bre brethren of Jesus were sons of Joseph by a former wife, whom he married before Mary. And a little bit further down, he says Mary remained a virgin in that same commentary. So she he's the first one to bring up this idea. And for historical context, it's important to remember that chastity and um, purity were highly becoming more revered, especially when we start moving into um, monasticism, which would be later on. Um, now, roughly at the same time as Origen, who did affirm this perpetual virginity of Mary, you have Tertullian writing around AD 207, so a little bit earlier. But he was writing, believing that the brothers in the Gospels were half-brothers of Jesus rather than cousins or step-siblings in his work against Marcion. Tertullian upholds the virginity of Mary at the conception of Christ, but obviously doesn't conceive of Mary as an ever-virgin. Now, some others who did affirm the perpetual virginity of Mary in the early church consists of Hilary Porters in his commentary on Matthew, Athanasius in his discourse against the Arians, Epiphanius of Salamis, Jerome, Ambrose, um, Augustine, Cyril of Alexandria, and so on. Now, most times that this topic is touched on, it's assumed by simply referring to Mary as the ever-virgin. So that, that's important. Whenever you're reading literature, um, sometimes it's just assumed to be the doctrine. Um, there were some, such as Basil, um, one of the Cappadocian fathers that we talked about through Nicaea, who held to the doctrine, but did not view it as dogmatic, which is worth remembering as well. So we're going to pause there for our discussion. Uh, and we're just going to summarize kind of the doctrine of Mary up until this point. So Mary, whenever we have writings about her, is always brought up in the context of reflecting upon the incarnation. That is the word being born in flesh. That is the doctrine of Christ, Christology as a whole. The early doctrines of Mary were thus her being ever virgin and theotokos. And theotokos is a Greek term, which means God bearer or mother of God. Now, theotokos had its focus on Christological affirmations in this time period to deny that Mary was theotokos, that is the mother of God. This was to deny that Jesus was truly God in the flesh. Um, so the man Jesus was true God. Therefore, Mary was theotokos because you can't split up the two natures of Christ, because it's two natures in one person. Um, so we're not discussing Theotokos in passing, but it's worth noting that this title was affirmed within early ecumenical councils and is a focal point in a couple of canons of these councils that do mention also the perpetual Virginia Mary, which I'll get to in a second. Um, uh, on that topic of Theotokos, this sh should be a title that Protestants can affirm with the understanding that it's really a affirmation of the hypostatic union and the doctrine of Christ more so than saying something about Mary. Usually it's used nowadays by Catholics to decorate Mary when that's not what it really was. Um, so again, the denial of Theotokos was seen to be a denial of the deity of Christ or a splitting of Christ into two different persons in the way that would treat them as two different subjects, right? And this is significant because, again, it coincides with Ever-Virgin in our canons of these ecumenical councils. Uh, the title of Theotokos was challenged by Nestorius, and this led to this big Christological debate um, for the Council of Ephesus in 431, which really didn't have much fruit until Chalcedon in 451. So this just gives you the context of why Mary was brought up at these councils. And at Chalcedon in 451, we see the perpetual Virginia Mary being assumed uh, whenever it references Mary, she is called the ever virgin. Um, and then you also see this occurring again at 553 at second Constantinople. Um, and the council reads in Canon two of the eighth session. If anyone does not profess that God, the word has two births, one from the ages from the father timelessly and incorporately. And in the other, in the last days of the same one who came down from heaven and was incarnate from the holy and glorious Theotokos and ever virgin Mary and was born from her. Let him be anathema. 
And so the teaching that Mary was ever virgin is at least assumed when one is speaking about Mary. Now, here's the thing. And this came up during my, my discussion on universalism. The idea was, well, you know, if, if you affirm what the council said about origin, then you have to confirm what it said about the ever virgin. Except that it doesn't say that the ever virginity of Mary is dogmatic. The focus is on Christology. If anyone does not profess that God has two births, one from the Father Timously, that is the eternal generation of the Son, and then one from the glorious Theotokos and ever virgin Mary, let him be anathema. What's the anathematization for? For those who deny that God in the flesh had two births, one from the Father eternally and one from Mary, the, the Theotokos. It does mention that she's ever virgin, but that is not the focus of the anathema here. So it is assumed, but even Catholics will admit that this is not indicative that the perpetual virginity of Mary was made dogmatic at 553 at Constantinople. And this is important because um, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, uh, it was affirmed at ecumenical councils that you allegedly affirm, but but it wasn't. It reaffirmed that Mary was Theotokos, and it called her ever virgin and, and passing, but that's not what the debate was about. Now, there was a council in Rome, the Lateran Council of 649, that in Canon 3 restates this assumption of the ever virginity of Mary, and it does declare it within the canon, ending that, quote, her virginity remained intact even after birth, end quote. Now, this council was not ecumenical, so it was a local synod in Rome. It was basically thrown away because it, it broke the parameters of what would be considered an ecumenical council. Um, and in fact, it was kept quiet for quite some time until, I believe, the third council of Constantinople when they finally decided to appeal the, the council and the writings essentially of Maximus the Confessor on the, the two wills of Christ. And so th that's just an interesting sidebar there. Uh, what was I saying? Um, so this council is significant in that it shows what was believed and assumed. Um, and especially in Rome, they had a high view of the perpetual virginity of Mary to make it canon. Um, but it's also less significant because it's not ecumenical, nor was it upheld um, whenever the sixth ecumenical council came around. If you read the sixth ecumenical council's definition of faith, you won't find this canon being reaffirmed or the Lateran council being reaffirmed because it wasn't ecumenical. So this is to say that the real dogmas of the ecumenical councils on Mary are the virginity of Mary, general, and Mary as Theotokos in relation to Christology. So an itching question that may be in the minds of those who are listening is what about the Protestant reformers? What did the reformers have to say on the subject when they were working on the Reformation? Interestingly enough, the big two reformers, Luther and Zwingli, among others, held to the perpetual virginity of Mary as well. Now, Calvin is often said to have held to it, but as far as I can tell, he seems to be indifferent or agnostic on the issue. Now, Luther's explanation can be found in his treatise, called that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, which was actually prompted by a rumor that he denied the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, Luther, in this work, actually blames the papists, that is, the Catholics, for the rumor, and continues to expand from there, holding that I am inclined to agree with those who declare that the brothers really means cousins here, for Holy Writ and the Jews always call cousins brothers. Be it as it may, it matters little. It neither adds nor detracts from the faith, end quote. In the same work, he has some heavy-handed words for the papists, as he says, Now just take a look at the perverse lauders of the Mother of God. If you ask them why they hold so strongly to the Virginia of Mary, they truly cannot say. These stupid idolaters do nothing more than to glorify only the Mother of God. They extol her for her virginity and practically make a false deity of her. The scripture does not praise the virginity at all for the sake of the mother. Neither was she saved on account of her virginity. Indeed, cursed be this and every other virginity if it exists for its own sake and accomplishes nothing better than its own profit and praise. And that's Luther's works 45, 205. Of course, I already told you that the name of the document is the that Jesus Christ was born a Jew. It's, it's a little bit lengthy. Um, he continues... For this reason, too, Scripture does not quibble or speak about the virginity of Mary after the birth of Christ, a matter about which the hypocrites are greatly concerned, as if it were something to the utmost importance on which our whole faith or salvation depended. Actually, we should be satisfied simply to hold that she remained a virgin after the birth of Christ because Scripture does not state or indicate that she later lost her virginity. We certainly need not to be so terribly afraid that someone will demonstrate out of his own head, apart from Scripture, that she did not remain a virgin. But the Scripture stops with this, and that she was a virgin before and at the birth of Christ. For up to this point, God had 
need of her virginity in order to give us the promise and bless the seed without sin, end quote. So at this point, Luther is in the same boat as I was thinking about this, that it's inconsequential, that it really doesn't matter which position you take on this. He believed that Mary was perpetually a virgin, but he said, even if that wasn't the case, it didn't really matter. What mattered to Luther is how it related to Christ, and that is keeping Christ from sin via the virgin conception and birth of Christ. And obviously he saw issues with the devotion given to Mary because of the issue. Um, now, Zwingli, uh, who is the Swiss reformer of, who was primarily understood as like the, the branch of the reform tradition, whenever you're considering Luther and Zwingli, you have the Lutherans and then you have the reformed Zwingli, was a Swiss reformer. And he affirms the idea in passing in a few passages. And it's interesting because you can actually see this in his discussions with Martin Luther and his friendly exegesis, that is exposition of the matter of the Eucharist to Martin Luther. And again, the idea is affirmed in passing with little emphasis placed on the doctrine. It's just kind of like, okay, moving on. Now, Calvin's agnostic position states simply um, something like this. So this is Calvin's commentary on Matthew 125. He says, quote, This passage afforded the pretext for great disturbances which were introduced into the church as a former period by Helvidius. Now, Helvidius is one that Jerome wrote against who denied the perpetual virginity of Mary. So Jerome uh, wrote against Helvidius, saying that Mary was ever virgin. Helvidius denied that. And that would be, of course, in Jerome's time, which is roughly the 5th century, right? Uh, so that's the context for you. Um, Calvin continues, The inference he drew from it was that Mary remained a virgin no longer than till f- her first birth, and then afterwards she had other children by her husband. Jerome, on the other hand, earnestly and copiously defended Mary's perpetual virginity. Let us rest satisfied with this, that no just and well-grounded inference can be drawn from these words of the evangelist as to what took place after the birth of Christ. And this, of course, is the passage which says regarding Joseph, but he knew her not until she had given birth to his son. So basically, he was like, this until doesn't really tell you what happened afterwards, right? Um, And I, I forgot that this um quotation by calvin explained the context so i'm sorry for the redundancy there i thought i pulled a different quote anyway so most scholars or many scholars rather agree with the encyclopedia of the reformed faith you can see page 237 that says quote calvin was likewise less clear-cut than luther on mary's perpetual virginity but undoubtedly favored it end quote now calvin's successor theodore beza agreed that there was agreement on the perpetual virginity of mary and you see this at the colloquia of poesy in 1561 and then a reformed document called the second helvetic confession by bullinger affirmed the doctrine as well in chapter 11 so this position was held by protestants for quite some time uh john wesley held to it for example um along with some of the reformers and so that's just another testament to it. And really, it can be held by a Protestant and it doesn't give up any footing. And I think I think Martin Luther sums up the broader picture well. So that's really where we're going to stop today with our historical survey. And then next week, we're going to talk about the scriptural theology. We're going to talk about the arguments for and against the perpetual virginity of Mary. We'll talk about the texts involved. We'll talk about how they're understood and interpreted. Um, as you've already kind of seen, uh, those such as Luther would say, well, you know, the, these could be stepbrothers, they could be cousins, they, they, they could be um, actual siblings. Those views existed back then amongst Protestants and amongst other Christians. Um, we talked about those ecumenical councils that assume the perpetual virginity of Mary, but not necessarily making them dogmatic. Uh, and so that's, that's good things to know, I think, that will hopefully give you an idea of, well, This was held by a lot of Christians before us, and so it's worth spending some more time on than just easily dismissing it as heresy, especially whenever we get to the Reformation, which, of course, um, we uh, live on the backs of the Reformation in terms of our fundamentals of the five solas and everything that came from those reforms. So again, I hope this episode was helpful. I hope it was clear. I hope it gave you some, some things to chew on. I hope that the next episode proves beneficial as well. And I hope you guys have a great, great weekend. Remember, you don't know my views yet on this issue. You just know the historical position on this view. Well, you know my view that I don't think it really makes much difference. That's that's the first component of my view that you have. So there's that. All right. Have a good one.